mode. All right, welcome everybody. Mike Hamilton here. By my clock, it's straight up on the hour what we were that we were scheduled to start at, but I'm still seeing a lot of people logging in. So I think I'm going to call this the official two minute warning. So just enough time to get comfortable, you know, finish up that last email. We will officially start in two minutes once everybody's had a chance to get logged in. But in the meanwhile, that also gives me time to do a quick technology check. I always like to make sure that things are working. So if you can hear my voice and if you can see the slide, the uh, title slide, please do me a favor and give me a quick yes in either the chat window or the question and answer panel. And that will let me know that I out oh, and a bunch of yeses already. So we are broadcasting, all is working. Gosh, another 30 people have logged in and just since I started talking. We'll call this again at this point, the one minute warning. We will officially start in about 60 seconds. All right, welcome everybody. We still have some people logging in, but we have more than the content we have time for, so we are just going to have to go ahead and roll. All right, for those who don't know me or haven't heard my presentations before, welcome. My name is Mike Hamilton. Officially, my title is the Vice President of Product Evangelism here at Madcap Software, but I like to joke that just officially means you should never let your business partner pick your title when you're away at a trade show in Europe. Um, I joke, um, I've been here since the beginning. I'm one of the founders here at Madcap. And what we plan to cover today, this is part four in a five-part series. So a lot of people have been asking, there's some really cool stuff out there in the customer showcase but every time I open Flare, yeah, I feel like I'm bumbling around. How do I get really cool looking stuff like is up in the customer showcase? So that's where this series, where it came from, it's kind of its genesis. And so we call this creating a modern documentation portal series. Now I have had some, some feedback from people who attended the first three sessions. They're like, yeah, this is nothing about documentation portals. This has all been CSS. That's the foundation. That's a huge part. If you can't master CSS, you'll never get the look and feel for an advanced output out of the, the Madcap Flare publishing system. So this is all a big buildup. The next session, Part five, that is going to be when we pull all these foundational components together. Next session, we're actually going to build a web portal. But this is part four. This is kind of the setup for that, that finale at the end. We're going to be taking all of the theory we've looked at in the first three sessions. And if you missed any of those, all the recordings are up, so you can go back and review those. But in session one, we talked about the fundamentals of the cascading style sheet language. Session two, we talked all about controlling text using cascading style sheets. Session three, we talked about controlling images and graphics using your cascading style sheets. But those first three were all theory. Session four now, what's the the old saying you know everybody wants to eat the sausage but nobody wants to see how the sausage is made well guess what part four here we're going to make some sausage today we're going to be opening the live flare editor and we're going to take all of that theory and actually build some styles however i'm getting ahead of myself here that's all a big build up 
and hopefully it wasn't too obvious I was stalling so people could all get logged in. Um, and it looks like people are still logging in, but we still have to get rolling. So before we officially start, before anybody asks, yes, this webinar is being recorded. The recording will be posted either later today or tomorrow. All of our webinars are recorded. And just by being a registered attendee, you will receive an email with a link to that recording once it is posted. And with this many attendees, all of your microphones are on mute, mute to protect your privacy. But there is that question and answer panel that is a part of the GoToWebinar interface. If at any point during the presentation you would like to ask a question, feel free to use that question and answer panel. I do have a second monitor up. I can see those questions as they come in. As long as I'm not overwhelmed with, you know, 20 million simultaneous questions, I will try to get to those as quickly as I can. All right, so now that housekeeping is taken care of, what exactly are we going to be looking at today? Well, on the CSS site, we're going to be introducing two new elements, two new selectors, div and span. Now, if you're already familiar with div and span, great. They are powerful. But especially a lot of people who are just starting with Flare, or maybe they've been using Flare for years, but they're just starting to crack into the cascading style sheet world. If all you're doing is styling, you know, headings and paragraphs and list items, an introduction to the div and the span elements is going to be an eye opener. They really open up your stylistic possibilities. So once we've introduced div and span, well, this is where we're actually going to get our hands dirty. We're going to be opening Flare live on screen, and we're going to very iteratively build several styles. We're going to start, I call it a note style. This could be a note, it could be a tip, it could be a danger, a caution. It's a pretty standard type of style, regardless of what you name it. A lot of times it's content that needs to be visually different than the rest of the page. It really needs to stand out. Very often it will have a graphic in front of it. How does one go about creating that type of a style. Well, we're going to do it two different ways. We're going to start as a single element style, meaning a paragraph style that I could apply to any paragraph text. But then we're going to look at a more advanced version. How would I do a multi element note or tip or danger or caution? So we're going to look at two different approaches to that type of a style. Then we're going to look at one of the areas that I think a lot of people try to carry over what they knew in the word processing world. And that really causes problems when you're trying to control white space or specifically margins and indents. CSS is a bit different and hopefully you'll find it's much easier than traditional word processing when it comes to handling margins and indents. But then we're going to leverage that a step further. And something that a lot of people struggle with is controlling margins and indents, but specifically when it comes to lists and why it's so frustrating and so hard. And once you see the trick, it becomes a, a lot easier. All right, so that's the plan of attack for today's session. Again, we're going to jump right in. We're going to start with that div and that span information. Now, first off, what am I even talking about? Well, big picture, I'll, I'll kind of paint a verbal picture here. Once you get into an XML world, it's very different than word processing. In word processing, you style the actual text. But once you get into markup languages, 
be that XML or HTML or, you know, whatever ML version you want to talk about. The content, if you look at the code level, it's actually wrapped by these opening and closing tags, these opening and closing angle brackets. Those angle brackets and anything inside of it is known as an element. Well, in a cascading style sheet world, we don't style the actual text. We style the opening element. So on a paragraph, we style the opening paragraph tag. You know, on a heading one, we style. Now, why is that important? Well, we can't just assign stylistic information to text. We have to have those, those opening tags, those angle brackets. Well, that's the key reason that div and span exist. These are just extra elements. They're extra sets of angle brackets that we can apply anywhere where we need to apply some additional stylistic information. So why are there two of them? Well, they work very differently. We'll start with div. Now, maybe I have a page that right now it has three elements. I have a heading one element and two paragraph elements. Now, in the nice visual editor in Flare, you don't see the tags, but they are there. They're behind the scenes. But what if I want all three of those elements to have a common styling? What if I want them all to have a dark gray background? Or what if I want that whole section to have a black border around it? Or what if I want that whole section to indent to the right in additional, you know, 40 pixels? The easiest way to do that is to just add a div container around those existing three element containers. So that's really all a div is. It's a container for other containers. So I can literally, each of these blue da uh, dashed lines indicates a single element. Well, div is just a great big element that will wrap around. It will encompass all of those individual elements. That means we can now add styles to that div, which will apply to that whole section, that whole group of content. I can now, because of that div, that extra container, I can treat that whole chunk of a topic as an individual unit. So that's the big advantage to a div. You could have an entire subsection that has a special background, a special, uh, you know, border, anything like that. So that's the div. It's kind of the, the big unit. But then we look at its little brother, span. Well, what if I just want one word? in one of these paragraphs to be bold. And please don't say you're gonna highlight that text and click the bold button. That's evil, that's inline formatting. We wanna avoid that. Well, that's where span comes in, where, where the big guy div wraps around existing containers. A span lets me create a smaller container inside an existing element. So I can actually wrap a span around a single word, and then I can apply a style from the style sheet to that span. And so now we can make that bold, or we can make that italic, or different color, or you know whatever look and feel we need. Um, so again, if you tend to think like a word processor, basically a span that's like a character style in a word processor. So a question came in. If we go back and look at that div style, would a div override 
the styling on the H1 or one of the paragraphs? The answer is no, it wouldn't. I, I don't have time to go into all the super deep details, but if you go all the way back to session two, where we talked about inheritance, basically, if I have a div that says text color should be purple, but then my heading one style says text color should be blue, well, it's going to be blue. And that is because right now the div is the parent of the heading one. Heading one is a child of the div. Because of that, if heading one didn't have a font color, then yes, it would inherit purple from the div. But if the div says font is or text is purple, but then the H1 says no, it's blue, well, the H1 will win. It's closer. It's literally applied to that element. Other question. So a span can be part of a div. I'll reword that a little bit. A span could be used on content that is inside of a div. Yes. Another question, can you create three column divs within a larger div? Oh my goodness, you got your thinking cap on. You're one session ahead of us. That is actually one of the key techniques we're gonna use in that final finale part five, where we actually build that web documentation portal interface. Now it's a little more advanced than your question there, not only can we have multiple divs inside of a larger div, but when you combine that with special styles, which Flare will let you do, you can actually create what's called responsive design. So I can set up a large container div with three smaller divs inside of it, such that when it's on a desktop web browser, my three smaller divs are side by side, but if it detects a smartphone interface, then my three smaller divs automatically stack up vertically. So it's almost like, I don't wanna say it's like a table, but it's like a really smart table. You know, if the screen is wide enough, you know, the cells are side by side, if the screen isn't wide enough, well, then the cells stack vertically. Again, that's why we're kind of, each of these sessions builds until we get to that final web portal in session number five. But you're on the right track. Um, would it work for print as well? Sort of. The key thing about print is you typically don't have, well, you you definitely don't have real-time size adjustments. When you're publishing to say PDF, you're setting a fixed page size. So you're typically only going to get a single presentation. But yes, that responsive design styling will work in that environment. It just won't be kind of adapting live if you resize your PDF reader other than the new kind of hybrid web mode that they have. It just means it zooms in and zooms out, gets bigger or smaller. I hope that made sense. All right, but in any case, the div element is important. It's a container, a large container. And then we talked about the span element. It again allows us to apply style information, but more of a character type of style. All right, now a quick review of the box model. Again, this is kind of a throwback to session two, but it's going to be critical for some of the things we're going to do in a few minutes on these note styles that we're going to create. So a very super fast review. If I create a topic and on that topic, I have a heading one and I have two paragraphs, well, to me, that's what I see as the human but that's not what the computer sees. The computer doesn't care what they are. 
it's just three elements. But the other sneaky thing, the computer has X-ray vision. The computer can see something that we can't. Every one of those elements has an invisible box around it. Now, why do we care about that box? Well, because all of your white space dimensioning, your indents, your margins, your spacing above and below, all of that is based on the invisible box that we can't see. I mean, how unfair is that? <laughs> but it's just how it works. So you can always tell somebody who doesn't understand the box model because they want this text to be hard left justified. So they dig around through their style sheet and they find the style property called margin. Aha, that's what I want. And they set margin to zero and the text moves to the left, but it only moves halfway and it stops and there's still a big gap here. Oh, well, that's not what I wanted. So what they typically do is they rummage around through the style sheet some more. They don't find anything else. So they go back to margin again. They set it to zero again. But this time when they click save, they click the mouse harder. Yeah, doesn't work that way. It, the text doesn't move any further. Well, that's a scenario where that person just ran head first into the box model and they didn't know it because the white space actually has three values, not just one. We do have margin, that's that red arrow there, but that's not the edge of the browser or the edge of the page to the text. That's the edge of the display area to the invisible box. That's one value. Then in blue, that little arrow is pointing at the invisible box itself. That is the border. Even though it's invisible, it can have a width. I mean, that box could be 10 pixels thick. And then the third value is padding. And people say, well, wait a minute, that's in tables. In a word processor, it's in tables. Once we get into a CSS world, everything has padding your paragraphs, your headings, your images, everything. So to control our left margin right now, if we really wanted that text hard left justified, we would have to make sure that border was set to zero, margin was set to zero, and padding was set to zero. Now, why am I wasting time on this when we already covered this back in session number two? Well, because we're gonna use this model now to our benefit. One of the things we're gonna do with our note style is we want a black border around our note style. Well, we can do that by actually setting the invisible blue dashed line here border to be visible. We can tell it we want it to be a solid line. We want it to be black. We want it to be one pixel or two pixels thick. But once we make that border visible, well, now if we want the whole black box to move, we would adjust our margin values. If we want to change the spacing between the text itself and the black border, well, then we need to adjust the padding values. So you end up using the box model a lot with the type of styles we're going to be creating today. Question came in. When you create a new element, a new paragraph, a new heading, anything like that, or even a new div, what are the defaults for those values? A lot of that depends if you have several settings on your body element, that's kind of the great grandparent of all other elements, those will inherit. But anything you haven't specifically set, those aren't blank. They actually inherit a default value as defined by the World Wide Web Consortium. 
And if you hop up to the W3C website, they do have a page where they list all of those defaults. So that's not a flare thing. That's actually a, a CSS thing. All right, so enough review of the box model. Yikes, time is getting away from us. We need to push forward. All right, so now the let's get our hands dirty part, building some actual styles in the Flare editor. All right, so here are the two examples that we are going to be creating. Now, they look very similar right now, but I'm going to turn on the structure bar in the left margin over here, and you'll be able to see the difference. So the first, the top danger example, notice that that is a single paragraph element. So this is going to be the one we do first. It's a little bit easier. It's a single element style. Whereas if we look at the lower example, it's actually two separate paragraphs, but then both of those paragraphs are now wrapped in one of those div elements. So this is more of a compound, you know, note, tip, or caution type style, rather than a single element type of style. We're going to do both. All right, so example one. So if our goal is we want the text, we want a bold danger colon in front of it, we want a little graphic on the left, we want our border turned on, but then we want to soften and round out the corners. So that is our goal. And hopefully I make life easy for a lot of people. I teach a lot of the training classes and I have a lot of students that think that somehow, you know, people with experience just sit down, magically type in a few lines of code and voila, there's a beautiful style. It doesn't work that way. It is a very, I'll, I'll even say it, it's a tedious, iterative process. But the nice thing is you only have to do it once, and then you have a style that you can reuse over and over and over again as necessary. So that is our ultimate goal, that danger style right there on screen. But what are we typically starting with? Well, in our Flare editor, we type in a sentence, and it's just an ugly little paragraph. Do not touch rotating machinery. How do we get that standard flare paragraph to look like that example above? Well, the first thing we have to do is we create a new style class. Now, again, if you're not familiar with classes, we covered that in session one. But basically, p.danger, that is a paragraph style with the class name danger. So that we need to create in Flare. All right, so I'm gonna hop into Flare real quick. Here is my Flare demonstration project I'm going to use. And here is that little paragraph that we need to create the style for. So what I would typically do I would go over into resources, style sheets, double click and open the style sheet editor in Flare. And I am gonna try and keep this entirely in the simplified style sheet editor, just to make it easy for the beginners. Everything I do here, you could also do in view advanced as well, if you prefer that version of our style, style sheet editor. But once I have the style sheet editor open, the magic button is up here on the toolbar. It says add selector. These items in the left column are known as selectors or classes of styles. So we're gonna click that add selector button. When the new selector comes up, the left-hand column is, okay, what kind of style are we creating? And you can create any kind of style you want. We're going to choose P for paragraph. But then under class name, 
what's the name of this individual style? And I'm going to name this danger and click OK. So now we've actually added a new paragraph style in our style sheet editor named with the class name of danger. Now, if I look at the preview, it's not changing anything yet. It's still normal text, but we have that style. At this point, I'll do a save. If we hop back into our topic, I can put my cursor anywhere inside this paragraph. And then we can actually come up here on the home ribbon, do the drop down, and I can select the style p dot danger and again nothing changed we haven't styled it yet but that officially has the style p dot danger applied so that was the first step just getting a new style in the style sheet all right so the next thing we want to do let's add the yellow triangle image with that exclamation point so this all comes from the third session we did together. We're going to be using the background image property to select our little PNG graphic. However, that's going to cause all kinds of chaos because it's going to tile, it's going to look ugly. We're going to have to do some more control here. So we're going to position it with the background position properties you know, X being side to side, Y being vertical. As far as side to side, we're gonna use a value of zero or left. We want it hard left, but then the vertical, we're gonna use center. And then finally, to keep it from repeating over and over again, we're gonna set background repeat to no repeat. We only want that little triangle graphic to appear one time. But, and we're going to do this live in a minute. This is, this is what Flair is writing for us. But when we apply this style, I got bad news. It's going to be ugly. It's going to look something like this. But don't get discouraged. This is progress. I mean, yeah, the text is on top of our graphic. That's not what we want. And the graphic is getting chopped off top and bottom. That's not what, we, but don't focus on the bad. Focus on the good. Hey, we've got an image. It's working. It's, it, it's where we want. We just need to keep going. All right, so before I go on with the theory part, let's actually do this live. So let me pull Flare back up again. Back into our style sheet editor. Now I'm going to double click on p.danger, that new style we created. We're going to go to the background tab. And where it says background image, we're actually going to use that little browse button over there on the right. And now I'm going to browse into, now if it wasn't in my project, I'd have to go navigate out, you know, use the little ellipsis button down here. But this is in my project right now. I have an image named Caution. It's in my graphics library. Once I've chosen that graphic, I click OK. All right now you can see that tiling I talked about. We don't want that repeat. So in the repeat box, we're going to select no repeat. So now the graphic only appears once. And then for our X and Y value, for X, we want it hard left. So I'll just choose left, or you could type in a zero. And then for Y, we want this centered vertically. All right, question, how do you add alt text to a background image. You actually don't. To make this new item responsive, we would add the alt text to the paragraph element 
that this style is being applied to. So styles themselves don't have the alt text. It's the content you apply them to that receives the alt text. I hope that made sense. All right, but everything we've talked about so far is configured. I click OK. Now, a beginner mistake is to immediately jump back to the topic and have a look, and nothing changed. Well, what happened? Well, if you notice up on my tab for my style sheet, there's that little asterisk that means I haven't saved yet. I have to do a save for these new style rules to apply. So I'll do a save. Now we'll go look at our topic. And just like predicted, the graphic is there. We've made progress, but the text is over it and it's being chopped off top and bottom. All right, so let's keep going. Let's iterate. All right, so now we want to make room for that image. We're going to start, and this is going to be a little controversial here, but I'm going to use the value or the property line height and set it to 40 pixels. Now, why am I going to do that? Well, right now, I know that that triangle graphic is 40 pixels tall. By setting my line height to 40 pixels, that will stop chopping off the top and bottom of my graphic. Now, there are some bad side effects of doing it this way. I'll explain those in a minute. The second thing we're going to do, remember the box model. Remember that padding value. I can move text around inside that box. So we're going to add padding left 70 pixels. By adding just these two, or actually we're going to add one more. That text was kind of tiny for the size of that graphic. So we're going to bump up the font size as well, just so it's not being overwhelmed by that graphic. By adding these three properties, now when it renders, ooh, that's looking a whole lot better. All right, so we're getting pretty close now, but the controversial bit, line height. That is not the ideal property to use in this case. What I would probably use in the real world is the property not line dash height, but min dash height. Why am I not using min dash height in this case? Because I'm trying to keep this in the simplified CSS editor for the beginners out there. The CSS beginner editor in Flare does not give you access to that property. You'd actually have to go to the advanced editor. So that's why I've, ma I've made the choice. It also keeps it easy because using line height, that's it. I only have to apply one property. The problem is once I do min height 40 pixels, well, now I'm going to be stuck adding a lot more of those padding values. I'll have to add some padding top, some padding bottom, keep things balanced out. So what's the problem with using line height? Well, as long as my text label here is only a single line, this works beautifully. The problem is if the text of my danger or my caution statement is too long and it line wraps, well, using line height will give you some exaggerated white space between each line if it line wraps. So if you're expecting it to line wrap, then I would definitely use min dash height instead of line height. But again, I'm going to have to adjust additional padding values then. If it's going to be just a single line of text, then using line height keeps it really quick and easy. So you know your content, your use case, you'll have to choose between those two different techniques. All right, we're just going to go with line height for this example, though. So once again, let's bring up Flare 
and let's do this live. All right, so back to our style sheet editor. Once again, I'm going to open p.danger. And now this time, I'm going to go to the paragraph tab. And here where we see line height, I'm going to choose the drop down. I'll choose length. It defaults to pixels. And I'm going to set it to 40 pixels. So that's going to make enough vertical room that we have our graphic and it's not chopped off anymore. Now we need that text to move to the right so it's no longer overlapping the graphic. And for that, we're going to go to indentation and we're going to set that to 70 pixels. And then we're going to go to the font tab and we're going to set our font size to 1.3 M units. And again, if M units are new to you, again, go back and review session two. We did a whole, you know, probably 10 minutes, 15 minutes on proper font sizing techniques. Um, question came in. I also have to do PDF. Is min height respected? Yes, it is. I actually use min height, max height, min width, and max width a lot just because it's so single sourcing flexible. So yes, it will be. All right, but I think we're all set now. We have our various values applied. We'll click OK. We'll do a save. And oh, Mike, I just made a rookie mistake. Not only did my text move to the right, but my graphic moved to the right. What did I do wrong here? Actually, it's good that this happened. I got such in a hurry, I totally forgot. I'll open up our style again, go to where I added, where it says indentation, that's not padding. That's actually going to be written as margin. And remember, that's going to move the whole invisible box to the right, everything. I'm going to put that back to zero. Silly me, what was I thinking? I actually have to go to the borders tab. And here's where we have our padding. So for left padding to be 70, I'll choose pixel. I'll do 70 here. There we go. Now you see the text moved to the right. Gave me a nice white space area here. Click OK. Click Save. And now we go back. That's looking a lot better. Now, one word of caution. It still looks like my image is being clipped a little bit. Don't assume. The more advanced styling you get, you can confuse the flare editor a little bit. The safest way to do a final spot check, go to the top left corner, click that preview, and actually preview it in a web browser. Ooh, and it is being chopped off a little bit. We need a little bit more line height. Well, that's easy enough to fix. Back in the style sheet. Back in p.danger, back to paragraph. And instead of line height 40, let's do line height 50. Not sure what happened there because this was well rehearsed. Let's do a save and see if that looks better. All right, now it's all happy. So we're getting there. Only a few more attributes left. So up here at the top, here's everything we've set so far. Now check out this monstrosity. To make that invisible border visible, we need Flare to write 12 new properties. 
border left, solid one pixel black, border right, solid one, on and on and on and on. But once I get Flair to write all this into the style sheet, well, now we've made the invisible box visible. Now, here's the good news. Getting Flair to write all of this is pretty straightforward. We jump back into the Flare editor, back into our style sheet editor. I'll open up p.danger again. If we go to the borders tab, we'll notice in the borders area, I can set each left, right, top, and bottom line individually if I need to, but there's also a group setting just to the right. So if I click on that group setting, and then on the top far right, I'm going to choose my color. Actually, I don't want gray. I want black. I want a solid line. Now, that could be a dashed line. It could be a double line. I mean, there's a bunch of choices. We're going to go with solid. And I'm just going to make it one pixel. So 1px. Click OK. Get a nice preview down here. That looks pretty good. I'm pretty happy with that. I'll click OK. Click Save. And now when we go back, okay, now we have our black box. Almost done. Final things we're going to do here, we're going to get that danger colon in bold to automatically be prefixed in front of our, our text. And we want those nice rounded corners. But once again, we need to trick Flare into writing a whole bunch of values for us. And once we get these final values, ding, 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 we're going to get the style that we really wanted from the beginning. All right, so we're almost at the finish line. So back to the Flare editor. Back to the style sheet. Let's open up p.danger. Now, how am I going to get Flare to inject that danger text? Well, we're going to use a feature in Flare in kind of a non-standard way. The Flare style sheet editor has support for what's called an auto number function. So if you want, for example, your figures, let's say we're publishing to PDF, it's a multi-chapter document. And if a figure is the third figure in chapter two, we want it to say figure 2-3 colon, and then the actual figure title. This is the editor that will let you do that. And the way you would do something like that, you would literally just type in figure space. And then down here, you can choose this chapter number attribute manually type a dash and then increment number and then colon and this is now a style where flare will automatically figure out your figure numbering for you well we're going to use this in kind of a non-standard use case i'm just going to come in here and manually type danger colon space even though it's not numbering this is automatically going to inject this text in front of anything I apply this style to. I could do the same thing with a caution or a note or a tip. Now, what a lot of people who figure this part out don't realize is you can also do formatting here as well. So right now I just have text, but there's a little drop down filter on the right here instead of showing the auto number commands, I can also choose format commands. So if I want that danger statement to be bold, I'll put my cursor at the very beginning. I'll come down to where it says start bold text and I'll just double click. That dropped in a little bold command. Then I'll go to the very end, insert my cursor and I'll choose end bold text. And so now whenever that gets inserted, it will be bold and in front of whatever we apply the style to. So now that label is taken care of. 
Now what about those radius corners? Well, once again, we'll go back to the borders tab. This is where we turned the borders visible. Well, right down below that, it says border radius. And once again, I can set them individually or there's a group setting on the right. I'll use that drop down, and I'm just going to bump this up to 10 pixels. Click OK. That looks pretty good in the preview. I'm pretty happy with that. Click OK. And save all one final time. And there we go. We have our graphic. We have our danger colon, we have our border, and we have those rounded corners. So, was it a lot of steps? Absolutely. Was it tedious? Yeah, a fair bit. But the big advantage is now I never have to do that again. I can just, you know, press enter, make a new paragraph. And if I start typing, it oh, helps if I get the caps key off. This is a new danger statement. And now when I apply p.danger, boom, it instantly takes on that look and feel. All right, and we just chewed up 50 minutes on that one. I have to kick it in gear here. All right, so how are we gonna do this Second example, again, this one's multi-element. Now, why would you need to do this? Well, sometimes, you know, you look at the style guide that marketing provided, and maybe caution is actually in a larger type size or in a different font than the descriptive text other, under it. It's much easier to do something like that with multiple paragraph styles, then I can wrap everything in a div and use the div to add the border, the graphics, all of that. So this would be a multi-element type of situation. All right, but back to our slides. And if you download the slides, I did put together kind of a, here are all the steps overview. We don't really need that right now. All right, so example two, that's our goal, but we're starting with just two paragraphs. So once again, we need styles, but we actually need three of them this time. And you can name these whatever you want. I call this P dot caution inside. It's a caution, but it's going to be inside of a div. Then I named the next one P dot caution text inside. This is the actual descriptive text. And then I named the div caution as well. Now, I'm not going to take the time to go through and iteratively build all of these again. It's the exact same techniques that we just looked at. But the way it works, we would start with p.caution inside, create a new class, set the font weight to bold. Set the font family to courier new. That's what marketing wants. And we set the font size to 2M units. They want the caution to be larger than any other text. Then we can actually apply that new paragraph style to the first paragraph. And that's what it will look like. Then we can work on the second style. P.caution text inside. This one's even simpler. It's just font family, courier new, font size, a little bit smaller, 1.6 M units. We apply that style. So now we have the caution, large and bold. We have the text inside, a little bit larger than normal, but still smaller than the first line. But now for the magic, the div. Now remember, a div is just a container that can be wrapped around any other containers. We're going to set up our div very much like we did that last example. All of our background image, 
border, border radius, all of those same attributes. But now when we wrap the div around those two paragraphs, basically the div kicks both paragraphs over to the right and makes room for our little triangle. Now, how did I get these like full on ovalized corners? Well, we just did a huge border radius, 40 by 40 pixels. So the top corner is about half of the height and the bottom, and it gives you that nice rounded look instead of just a, a rounded off corner. Now, again, how do we do this in the real world? We'll pull Flare back up real quick. I'll go to my caution paragraph, and I've done my best Julia Childs here. We'll come down. Here's P dot caution inside. There, my caution's larger. Put my cursor in the next paragraph down, and then we'll apply P dot caution text inside. So that's a little bit, not quite as large as the caution, but larger than regular text. But now for the magic, how do we get, oh, and there's already a div there. That's not supposed to be there. Unbind. All right, there we go. So that's what we're starting with. But here's where a lot of people struggle. How do you get Flare to insert a div for you? It's easy. Using my mouse, I'm going to highlight both paragraphs. Then, if we go up into the paragraph group up on the main ribbon, there is actually a group icon. If I click that group icon, it will bring up any of my available div elements. I'll grab div.caution, click OK, and boom, there we go. So now we've got that compound element, but a similar look to what we did with the single element style. But that brings us to, again, there's a wrap up slide for that technique. But now this brings us to one of my favorite techniques that I like to share with people. There is a way to make creating a multi-element note or tip like that much easier. First, you do all that styling we just did, apply it one time to some actual content, but if you've ever worked with Flare snippets, you can actually select the div, that parent container, and convert the entire div to a Flare snippet. Then whenever you need a new multi-element, you know, note, tip, or caution, you just insert that snippet. And you say, well, yeah, but they're all going to be identical then. Oh, that's the trick. Once you've inserted it, right-click on the snippet and convert to text. We're cheating. We're basically using a Flare snippet as a component template. All right, so I know some people are visual learners. Let's actually see this work. We'll bring Flare back up. So let's say here, caution, oven surfaces can be hot, but in a different topic, I need caution. No freezer surfaces can be cold. But I don't want to have to rebuild this whole thing and apply all these styles. So here's the magic. I'm going to right click on this div from the right click menu, create snippet. And again, I'll just name this caution number 46 and click create. So now if let's just pretend I'm in another topic somewhere, I'll say insert snippet. I'll grab caution 46, click OK, and now it's a snippet. I can't edit this, 
but if I right click on it and I choose convert to text, well, now it goes back to being a div in two paragraphs. And now you can edit that bottom text to be whatever you want. So that's a sneaky way to use the Flare Snippet library as component templates. All right, I realize we're at the hour. I think we can finish in about 10 more minutes. My apologies for going long. I got a little involved with that first example, I think, but indent control. This one's cool, it's powerful. What throws people, when they transition over from word processing, they reach for that tab key and it doesn't really work the way you would expect. There really is no concept of tab in the CSS language. So how can we control indents and things? Actually, it's pretty straightforward. Remember my buddy, the div? We can actually create an indent div. And the reason I bring that up is a lot of people bring their word processing bad habits into a CSS world. Um, I'm not going to throw any rocks and name any names, but about four months ago, I worked with a customer that had imported thousands of pages of FrameMaker content. And the challenge was all of their styles were in triplicate. They would have, you know, p dot danger root and then in the same style sheet they would have p dot danger indent one and then in the same style sheet they would have p dot danger indent it's like all of their styles were in triplicate depending on where they wanted the indent levels that's horribly wrong that's the way you did it in a word processor once you get into a css world into a flare world don't apply any indent information on your paragraphs, on whatever your core margin is, just set that on body. But then for any additional indents, we want to use our buddy, the div. So don't go style crazy. And if you set it up correctly, you can have multiple levels of indent with a single div style. Now, how in the world? Well, we go into a standard looking topic. So here I just have a heading one and several paragraphs. And if we render this in a web browser, you know, it looks like a normal page with paragraphs. But notice that there's paragraph 2A and 2B in there. What if we want those two indented to the right? Well, we'll go into our style sheet. I'll create a div class called my indent and literally apply one property. Margin left, 18 point. That's it. Easy peasy. We're, we'll do this in Flare Live here in a minute. Then we go into the editor. We would apply that div around those two paragraphs. So we don't have to change the paragraph styling at all. We just wrap them in a div. And now when we render that in the web browser, well, those two paragraphs get that nice indent. And what's nice is what if I want a heading three, a paragraph, and a list all to have the exact same indent? Well, I just wrap that whole chunk of content with that single div and all three of those elements will indent at the same time. All right, so back into Flare real quick. Once again, we go to the style sheet editor, add selector up on the toolbar. I want a div type element this time, so we'll scroll up to the letter D locate div and then for class name i'll just name this demo indent and hope i haven't used that name before nope we're all good all right so flare is now creating that new class 
Flare is adding that to the style sheet. And now if I locate div dot demo indent, there it is. I can double click on this and open it. And we can just go to paragraph, left indent, and we'll set this to, oh, I totally forgot. What was the value we were going for? I'll just do 30 pixels, something exaggerated. Make it easy to see. But that's the only value. Click OK and then save. So now if we go to our topic, um, let, let me go ahead and add a subheading here just to show that we can do this on multiple elements at the same time. All right, so here I have a heading to a paragraph, a caution, a paragraph, and a caution. Using my mouse, I'll highlight everything. And then again, we'll go to that group icon on the home ribbon. And here is div.demoindent. I choose that style, click OK, and now everything just indented 30 pixels. But wait, there's more. I want a second level indent. I'll grab this paragraph and this caution, and I'll do it again. I'll apply div.demoindent. And now I have another 30 pixels of indentation. So hopefully you can see that I can have eight different levels of indent if I need by simply applying that same div style over and over. I didn't have to create, you know, a jillion new styles in my style sheet to accommodate having all these multiple indents. Question, is it possible to set up a style sheet such that all headings are outdented? Absolutely. We don't, we're already over time here. I don't really have time to get into that, but yes, that can be done. That's probably just a quick Google search away. Just um, do a Google search on CSS heading indent control. And I know you're talking outdents, but that's kind of the category that will take you to dozens of resources. It will give you the exact technique that you need. All right, we have one more thing I want to cover very quickly and we will wrap up. And that is list indents. This will be quick. We don't have to do anything live for this one. But here's the problem. Quick review of that box model. Again, every element has the box that we can't see. That's that invisible border. Outside of it, you have margin inside of it you have padding the problem that you have with lists is that lists are compound elements now what do i mean by that well if we look at a list there is one invisible box and that in this case it's a bulleted list so it's an unordered list this blue box represents the UL element, but inside of that, we have three LI elements, list items. The problem is all of those elements have margin, border, and padding. So the UL element has margin and padding, then the list item has margin and padding. So we're not dealing with three or or even, you know, elements. We're dealing with six. So that can be a major challenge. Um I see a note from somebody they just experimented trying to get min height to work. 
do me a favor, do an actual preview of an output. Min height is a relatively new property and it can confuse the flare editor a little bit. It might look a little bit wonky in the editor, but then you do a preview and it looks beautiful. So give that a try. All right, but back to here. So here's the challenge with lists. As long as you're trying to increase the indent, it's easy. You can choose either margin or either padding value. And as long as you increase those, your indent keeps increasing. The challenge comes when you want to decrease the indent on a list. It's very easy to get one of these values down to zero and you still have more indent than you want. So you just have to realize it's really a best case to keep them balanced. So if right now my UL has an indent of, you know, 10 point or a margin of 10 point and a padding of 10 point, and then my list item has a margin of 10 point and a padding of 10 point, well, if I want that to be overall reduced, rather than taking one of those to zero, your best performance will be to reduce all four of them. So instead of having, you know, all tens, you know, make them all seven point. Because that's going to end up knocking 12 points of indent off because you're losing three points of margin, three points of padding on both elements. That's not as critical as it used to be, but there were some older browsers that if you didn't keep these number balanced, I can't remember, it was like in Internet Explorer, it would look good, but then in Firefox, the bullet would be under the text. It was really wonky. So we, some of us old timers learned just to keep those values somewhat balanced. Oh, and if you use a P tag inside the list item, then you have even more. Or what if you have a nested list? And this goes, it's so, lists can be really problematic if you haven't worked with them before. But there's a trick I came up with, at least this helps me. What I do, I go into the Flare Style Sheet Editor, I create my own custom medium, and I make all the invisible borders visible. It's amazing how much easier that can make your life. So to give you an example, let me pull this up. I'm just going to randomly create a couple of lists here real quick. And just for giggles, we'll do a nested list, just so we can do kind of a worst case scenario. So trying to adjust these margins and indents is going to be a nightmare. But watch this, instead of medium default, I have a medium I created, I called it adjust margin. And how much more of a fighting chance do I have now? The UL elements are blue, the list item elements are a darker blue, and the paragraph elements are red. Now those two blues I could have made a bit different, more different, but at least it gives me a fighting chance. On my UL, I can see, oh, I've got some pretty good margins, some pretty good padding. But then I get to the list item, and ooh, I might be able to use a little bit more padding inside of there, that's not very good. It just, doing this trick gives you a fighting chance. My apologies, Brian, if you're upset, you can always view the recording. That's why these are recorded. Ugh. You give people free training and they get mad at you. All right. But the good news is that brings us to the summary. So we've looked at div and span elements. We've looked at two different note styles. We talked about simplifying margin and indent control. And then the scary one, list indent control and some techniques that might make life a little bit easier for you. 
All right, so before we wrap up, I do have some announcements that they've asked me to make. There's running a, a deal right now, just mention that you attended the webinar and there's discounts for anybody doing any bulk purchases. And also, if anybody would rather do some more in-depth training, we are planning to go ahead the way things are opening back up. We're gonna be doing Mad World in Austin, Texas this year in October. I don't know if this has been officially announced publicly or not, but it looks like we will be doing some remote attendance capabilities over the web as well. So keep an eye open for that. This is gonna be like three full days of in-depth training. But with that, um, honestly, I don't think we really have time for any questions. I tried to get to the questions as they came in. But thank you so much, everybody, for attending. I hope this was helpful. I hope it's beneficial. Again, this is the final buildup. And then our fifth session, we're going to be putting all of this content together and building those portal interfaces. So with that, thank you so much, everybody. Have a great rest of your day and an even better rest of your week. Cheers, everybody.